So I was in the car driving around with some people and the group was talking about how a particular girl was actually raised like a boy. Her dad is raising her like a son, someone said. We've seen this in movies too, like in A League of Their Own, when the single dad apologizes for raising his daughter like a boy. All right, come on, let's go. I raised him like a little boy. I didn't know any better. Because she wasn't pretty enough to go and make the women's baseball team. And it made me think, what does it mean to be raised like a son? What does it mean to be raised like a daughter? What does it mean to act like a girl, act like a boy? If we're willing to challenge our assumptions and our perspectives and push back on these mental models that have ingrained in us around gender, I think we're gonna be able to better navigate this gender revolution and understand the complexities of gender with a little more depth and breadth. So I'm trying to think about it and answer the question, what does it mean to be raised like a boy. So think about it like you have a male baby who's becoming a toddler and then becoming a child and then becoming a teen. And so what are the significant differences in the way you would engage and relate to and parent that child who's a male or a boy versus a female child or a girl? So I wanna backtrack for just a moment and get clear on some language because I make a distinction between a biological body, which I refer to as male and female, and then the way that we live that out based on social standards, rules, and expectations, which I call then being a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. So we can have some shared understanding as we go through this video. I'm referring to how parents relate to their male baby and treat him like a boy or their female baby and then treat her like a girl. It's important to know that this actually has nothing to do with being transgender. It's simply how we understand boy and girl. And if we start unpacking this a bit, we see that the way we've created these divisions around gender don't make a whole lot of sense. So there may be some obvious things that we do early on, like you might cut your boy child's hair to keep it short. You might not put your boy child in a dress and you might buy your boy child trucks and superheroes. But let me ask you this, like why couldn't you do that for a girl? Why do we even associate long hair with girls and women? It's just hair after all. But how often do you hear people say to boys or male teenagers when they have this long, crazy hair, son, you need a haircut. And you rarely hear that when it comes to girls. And again, the question is why? Even though there are certainly boys and men with long hair, and there are girls with short hair, a lot of girls wouldn't want to cut their hair short because they don't want to look like a boy. So here's something that seems relatively arbitrary, like hair length, and yet there's a definite assignment of a certain kind of hair that goes with boys and a certain kind of hair that goes with girls. And while there's exceptions, the rule is still there. And so let's think about having a little girl child. You might give her dolls, dress her in pink, put her in dresses, but would you prevent her from playing with balls? And what is it about letting your little girl child play with trucks and tools and superheroes that seems so off? And maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's fine, I would let her play with trucks. But how often do you go to a little girl birthday party and see someone gift her trucks and tools and superheroes? You don't. In one trip to the toy section in Target, it is abundantly clear which aisles are for the girls and which aisles are for the boys. But again, why? Here's kind of a fun fact for you. Did you know that blue was originally associated with girls? Because it was associated with the Virgin Mary in Christian tradition. And blue was a symbol of purity and innocence. And it actually wasn't even linked to gender at all. And there's an article that dates back to 1918 from a trade publication that actually said pink was for girls because pink was decided on being a stronger color. But then in post-World War II, we saw these shifts in marketing and consumerism, and it was an arbitrary decision for manufacturers and retailers to say that pink is for girls and blue is for boys. And really, this was a marketing strategy and they pushed it on parents to buy particular clothes for their particular children. So once we understand that the creation of these categories and associations were random, and when we stop and be thoughtful and recognize that these categories actually don't make any sense and they don't even serve us, then we can start to be curious about our own deeply held ties to the ideas of gender norms and how we perpetuate those ideas of things being more suited for a boy or suited for a girl. Interestingly, I have four children, three boys and one girl. And it's probably related to my own experience around gender and breaking gender norms pretty much my whole life. But I never really thought about making sure that I did boy things with my sons and girl things with my daughter. In fact, I think I tried harder to work against those stereotypes that the world tried to put on my kids. But really, you know, we're a sports family and 
all the kids played sports, and we loved music, and all the kids played piano. So it wasn't so much that the boys needed to do this and the girls had to do that, but we wanted the kids to really be able to figure out who they were. And of course, what we loved in the world, like sports and music and martial arts, we had them do. But it wasn't so much because that they're boys or girls, but more this is the kinds of things we wanted to expose them to. You know, as my sons become young men, I want them to think critically about what like a man even means. When we say, Take it like a man or man up. Does that mean to be confident, secure, smart, and stable? Or does it mean to be emotionally constipated, detached, and unaware of your feelings? The narrative that men are supposed to be tough and distant from their emotions is hurting them and it's hurting the people in their lives. Boys thinking they always need to be strong, that asking for help is a sign of weakness, and they're defined by status, forces them to lose a large part of their humanity. Our emotions are part of what makes us who we are. Our ability to ask for help and receive help is a prime way that we can connect with others on a deep level. Why would we want to deprive our boys and the men in our lives of these things? I guess if you think about manning up, meaning being confident, secure, and facing your challenges head on, don't we want our daughters, our girls, and our women to do that as well? Again, when we start to think about these gender expectations that have been put upon us just because we're male or female, we see that most of them don't make much sense. And yet we continue to adhere to them even at the expense of our own personal expression, authenticity, and freedom. And then let's think about the clothes that we wear. What is it about a button-up shirt and slacks that say man? And what is it about a dress that says woman? Why is it so uncomfortable for so many people to see somebody who they think might be a man wear a dress? If it seems like I'm just throwing out questions and not really supplying answers, it's because to me, these questions are kind of rhetorical. My answer to these questions, the reason why seeing a person with hairy chest and hairy arms in a dress makes us uncomfortable is because we're not used to it. It breaks our mental model about what we think a man or woman should be. But if we allow ourselves to really deconstruct our ideas and see how rigid and troublesome they are, we start to find that we can become more free. The problem is that these ideas around the very strict rules for men and women related to their gender expression end up manifesting themselves in prejudicial thoughts and cruel behaviors. People who violate gender norms are teased and ridiculed and called weird. Kids are bullied. We know that gender non-conforming kids suffer more anxiety and depression. And for what? Why? There are a lot of issues we need to unpack around sex and gender, but at the core, most of the problems and challenges that we face around gender come from our own discriminatory attitudes, which are all based on fear from being pushed into something that is unfamiliar and unknown to us. I want to be really clear that I'm not saying I think everybody should violate gender norms, but I do think we need to give ourselves more space and freedom to explore who we want to be in the world and how we want to be in the world. We need to find a way of dressing and acting and being that feels true for us not based on social expectations. And so if you're a parent or if you're an educator that works with younger kids, we really need to evaluate how much we force gender norms on our kids. I'm certainly not saying that we want to force them outside of gender norms just for the sake of it, but I am saying we need to be more conscious of how often we impose those gender expectations on our kids and understand the impact of doing that. What I invite us all to do is to spend the next week being aware of your thoughts on gender and sex. Notice the places that you follow gender norms and just ask yourself, am I doing this because I think I'm supposed to? Or am I doing this because this is really my true expression of myself? Here's a story about this. I teach a gender and leadership class. I've taught it at several different places, three different universities at the undergraduate level and two different community organizations. Every single time I teach the class, the women talk about the pressure they feel to have to get ready for the day by putting on makeup, doing their hair, and dressing nice. In fact, every time I teach this at the undergraduate level, every single time, the young women in the class share how they envy the student athletes because the female student athletes can get away with wearing their sweats and college sweatshirt with their hair tied back in a ponytail and nobody cares. But these young women think that if they showed up that way because they're not athletes, they would be judged. And this is consistent with what many women in my leadership programs talk about, how they love their Sundays to dress in sweats and a t-shirt and don't do any makeup and just throw their hair back in a ponytail. But if they were going to leave the house, even just to go to the store, they would change. 
the pressure we feel to show up in a certain way based on being a woman or a man, it's holding us back. And you can see that the judgments and resistance around being gender neutral, the all-inclusive bathrooms, using pronouns, being non-binary, being gender fluid, it all comes down to feeling tied to the stereotypical concept of what it means to be man and what it means to be woman. So how can we learn some of the ideas that have been ingrained upon us but now no longer serve us? What's amazing about this gender revolution is it's offering us all freedom to be more fully human. If you're up for it, I'll put a few questions in the description and you can do those as reflections. And there's a whole bunch of other videos on issues related to gender that I have on my channel that I hope will challenge your thinking and invite you into a space of curiosity and maybe even a little more self-awareness and personal authenticity. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I know time is our most valuable commodity. I'd love to have comments and questions down below. Keep it clean. Keep it appropriate. I'm not interested in you spewing hate my way. I will delete those comments because they're hurtful to the people who come to this channel and watch these videos trying to discover their own sense of self and find their confidence in their gender expression. But if you have something thoughtful to say, if you have ideas that can spur conversation and dialogue, I'm all for that. Thanks again for being here and I'll see you next time.